There's a story that has become pretty widely known in Lubavitch over the past few years. And it is a really incredible story. It's a poignant story. It's a painful story. It's almost an uncomfortable story. And I'll tell you the story the way I heard it. I've seen it also on film in parts, but this is the way I heard the story. The two Lubavitcher Bachem are sitting on an airplane, going from one place to another. And across the aisle from them is sitting a, an elderly gentleman, a middle-aged man, very well-dressed. And he's missing an arm. And he leans across the aisle, and he says to the two Bachrim, Atem Chabad, you're Chabadniks? He said, yeah. You remember the Rebbe? They said, of course. She says, I have a story with the Rebbe. And she said, put him a Rebbe. And he tells them the following story. That he was in the Yom Kippur War. And he was wounded. He lost his arm. And um, he visited America subsequent to that. Sometime during the 70s, he may have been in the group of the Paralympics, the famous video of the Rebbe meeting with the Israeli delegation to the Paralympics, but I, I, I'm not certain that that was the case. He visited America, and however it was arranged, he had a yachid as he had an appointment by the Rebbe. Sayyari Yechidis, of course, the Rebbe greeted him and certainly thanked him and blessed him and so on. And in the course of the Yechidis, he said to the Rebbe, Yesh li sheila, harabi melobavach, yesh li sheila, I have a question. And he proceeded to tell the Rebbe the most remarkable story. The story basically is that they were stationed on the Sinai, on the, on the southern coast of the Sinai, which is near Egypt. And of course, we all know the tragedy of the beginning of the Yom Kippur War, where there were many, many thinly defended fortifications that were very quickly overrun by the Egyptians. Many Jewish boys lost their lives, and it required extraordinary miracles. Incredible, incredible nisim that the Arabs shouldn't get all the way to Tel Aviv. He and a group of young men, soldiers, were in one of these outposts along this border and um, the Egyptians had overrun many of the other positions maybe they were a little bit inland but they got a message from their superior from Arik Sharon who was responsible for the southern front and the message basically said that they are not allowed to abandon their post because basically they're the only thing standing between the Egyptians and Tel Aviv and they have to stand and fight until they can't fight anymore essentially he gave them orders to fight until they, until they would lose their lives. This group of soldiers appreciated the responsibility that they had, and they prepared to fight to the death. That's basically where they, they saw it. Naturally, the mood in this particular group, I don't know how large a group it was, what do you call it, a company or a platoon or a division? It wasn't a division. It was a small group of men and a few tanks, was terrible, was morbid. They expected that the Egyptians were going to come over some kind of a hill, there'd be a firefight, they'd be outnumbered in a completely ridiculous way, and it was only a matter of time. As they're sitting there waiting for the inevitable attack by the Egyptians, the mood is obviously very depressed, and the conversations are about death and about things that people normally don't want to think about, let alone talk about. And in the midst of this terribly depressed Circumstance, one of the boys in this group gets up. He happened to be religious, from, And he made a speech. And the substance of his speech was, he asked his fellow Jews why it is there was such a hatred directly towards them. Why was it that so many people wanted to destroy them? Why was there such an intolerance, such a deep vitriolic hatred for this tiny little state of Jewish people? that so many people had so much invested Ahmad al in destroying it. And he said, the answer is because we're Jews. It's not because we're Israelis, it's not because we're on Palestinian land, it's because we're Jews. And there's a long-standing history of anti-Semitism. And the truth be told, 
that this reality of anti-Semitism goes to the very, very core of what a Jewish person is, that we're the nation of God. And he said to the group of boys he was with, listen, we are going to have to give our lives to protect the Jewish homeland. Let us die like Jews. Let's behave in the best tradition of the Jewish history where we don't simply fold, we don't be, simply give in, we're going to fight like lions, like warriors until the last drop of blood and we're going to go in the same spirit and with the same passion and with the same dedication and with the same sacrifice and disregard for self as our ancestors have done over the ages and over the millennia which have brought us to this day. The reason we're able to identify as Jewish people because before us came many who sacrificed all that their descendants should be able to identify as the descendants of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yankiv. And he made this very impassioned speech that came from a very deep place in his heart, clearly. And it bore deep into the hearts of this little group of Israeli soldiers, most of whom were not religious. And the entire mood changed. They found themselves in a disposition of readiness, of alertness, of purpose. They all understood the inevitable consequences, but there was a certain clarity of purpose which was very, very motivating and very, very positive. A few hours later, the Egyptians found them, and there was a firefight that lasted for hours and hours. Now this man, I think his name is Levi, Moshe Levi perhaps, is telling the Rebbe this story, and he adds, I had made a haklata, I made a resolution, that if I would survive this battle, I would put on film every day. The Egyptians came upon them, and they were outnumbered in extraordinary ways, and they fought for hours. They just kept on fighting and fighting and fighting, and the Egyptians withdrew. The Egyptians withdrew. Explain it how you wish. They didn't have any idea what they were up against. They thought it was a trap, an ambush. The Egyptians withdrew, and they were, they were there. They were still alive. They looked around to see what were the casualties of that battle, and there were only two. That young religious boy who had charged them, who had inspired them, who had invigorated them with a readiness to die, was dead. He lost his life. And I, he says to the Rebbe, lost my left arm. So he finishes telling his story. And he says, Harabi Melubavich. Could you possibly explain this to me? The one who inspired all of us, the one who was the source of the energy that it took to have this extraordinary courage, lost his life. And I, who had resolved to put on film, don't have an arm. I can't put on film even if I want to. So he told the Rebbe the story. He asked the Rebbe the question. And the Rebbe thought, he didn't respond immediately. He went to sort of like a meditation for a minute or so. And then the Rebbe sat up. And he said, Ken, I can explain it to you. And he said the following. When that young Bokhar, your friend, rallied all of you, mobilized all of you, for Mesiris Nefesh Al-Kiddush Hashem, to sanctify their lives, to sanctify the name of, to sacrifice their lives, to sanctify the name of God Almighty, he called out within himself, within his own subconscious, a real readiness for Mesiris Nefesh. He brought out the deepest levels of his neshama where he was prepared to die for God. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God Almighty, decided to accept his carbon, to take his his readiness. And you, the Rebbe says to this young man, Hashem wants you to know that He does not love you because of the mitzvahs you perform. This is the story. I have no doubt that some of you watching this are disturbed by this story. I'm also disturbed by this story. But you can be disturbed in a way that you feel like it's wrong, and that would be wrong. And you can be disturbed in a way where you feel like this is very intense. 
This is a story about Mesiris Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem. In English, you would say it martyrdom. Sacrificing one's life to sanctify the name of God. We don't like Mesiris Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem. We're not allowed to like Mesiris Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem. But it's a part of what a Jew is. It's part of our tradition. It's part of our history. And each one of us is here because someone gave his life at one point in the past for us to be able to be here. It's very, very uncomfortable because it talks to an element of being a Jew which is not logical. But the element of the Jew which is not logical is the truest Jew. And in the world in which we live, where on the one hand we are so driven by reason and logic, on the other hand, Baruch Hashem, fortunately, for the most part, we don't have to be martyrs. Nobody is putting us in a position that to be a Jew, you have to be Mesa Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem. This phenomena has become so uncomfortable that we're almost unaccepting of the fact that this is part of what the Ebishter has given us, part of our tradition. There's an interesting story which I've told before that when Dr. Zelikson got married, Dr. Zelikson got married in Hanukkah Tov Shunid it was still 1951. The Rebbe was not yet a Rebbe a year. He got married in one of the halls, maybe even in Manhattan. And the Rebbe went to his chasana, the Rebbe went to the wedding, he was at the Kabbalah's Ponim, he spoke several sikhs, and of course the Rebbe was the Masad the Gedush, and he, so he officiated at the wedding. The minig was, the custom was, that before the Rebbe would arrive, the chasana would chazer a maimed. I don't know whether Dr. Zalikson did or didn't chazer a maimed. That's not important at the moment. But when the Rebbe would arrive, obviously the chasana didn't speak. The Rebbe would say, Sikhas, Tere. The Sikhas that the Rebbe said by Dr. Zalikson's Kabbalah's Ponim, many, many years later, were actually edited by the Rebbe. When Dr. Zalikson passed away, his son, Rabbi Chol Gazunzain, published a book which is called Teldut Rav Avraham It's the biography of his father. When he prepared that book for print, he sent in the sikha that the Rebbe said by his father's Kabbalah's Ponim. The Rebbe edited the sikha, it's printed in that sefer, and later on was published in Lukut HaSichas. It's in the Safas of Lukut HaSichas, Chelek Lamed, volume 30 of the Lukut HaSichas. That sikha involved the idea of Mesiris Nefesh. And the Rebbe discussed various levels of Mesiris Nefesh. I'm going to get to this later. At the end of the Sikhe, there's a short note that there were two Rabbonim present who were not Labavachers, because Dr. Zelikson's Rebbe in Balabasta was not from a Labavacher family. She came from what we call Yekis, from Germanic Jews. And there were two Rabbonim from that Kehillah who were present at the Kabbalah's Ponim. And the Rebbe spoke so powerfully about the idea of Nefesh, so at the end of the talk, one of the two Rabbanim asked the Rebbe, Lubavitcher Rebbe, why are you talking about Mesiris Nefesh so much? Now, of course, I wasn't at that tzichet, I wasn't born. But I can imagine the spirit of the question. The spirit of the question was, it was five and a half years after the Holocaust. It wasn't exactly like Jewish people needed to talk about Mesiris Nefesh, HaKiddush Hashem. We all knew it, from our families, from our homes, from our communities, it was all around us. And I suppose this Rav felt that it was perhaps insensitive for the Rebbe to dedicate such a long conversation, notwithstanding that it was Hanukkah, to Mesiris Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem so soon after the Holocaust. And the Rebbe's response is a bit cryptic. The Rebbe said to him, The Rebbe de Shverad Yazak, as in America, Dafin Reden wegen Mesiris Nefesh. The previous Rebbe said that in America you must discuss Mesiris Nefesh. That's the whole exchange. Now, what is the meaning of the response? What does it mean? The Rebbe de the previous Rebbe, said, as an American definition of Mesiris Nefesh, you have to discuss Mesiris Nefesh. So I believe the answer is obvious. Tanya chapter 25, Tanya Perikhof Hei, talks about Mesiris Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem. And at the end of the chapter, the Alter Rebbe brings a very interesting idea. Moshe Rabbeinu, spoke to so the generation of Jewish people who were destined to go into the Holy Land and build it on the union of Mesiris Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem. al Rebbe says that when Moshe said to them, Shema Yisrael, Havaya Lekein, Havaya Cha, this is a charge for Mesiris Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem. And the al Rebbe asks a simple question. The Jewish people going into the Holy Land were one of the safest generations ever. 
The Pasuk says, Pachtachem, Omerachem, Yitin, Adeshem, Al-Kol, Avem, that Goyim are going to fear them. Their lives are going to be safe and secure. Why would Moshe Rabbeinu speak to a generation of Jews who would not need to employ Mesidus Nefesh Al-Kiddush Hashem because their lives would be so secure, why talk to them about the idea of Mesidus Nefesh Al-Kiddush Hashem? And the Alter Rebbe's answer in simple words is as follows. When people have to go on Mesiris Nefesh, HaKedosh Hashem, you don't have to talk about it, you do it. When you live in a time when Mitzad Brochas and the Mebish, the God Almighty's blessings, there is no likelihood of actually being Mesiris Nefesh, HaKedosh Hashem, then you have to talk about it. When you're living in a time, you're living in a land where life is peaceful and safe and blessed, then you talk about Mesiris Nefesh, HaKedosh Hashem. Why? Because we need... Mesiris Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem as a motivation in our lives. And if we do not have to deal with the prospect, with the test, with the Nisayan of Mesiris Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem in our actual lives, so we discuss it, we talk about it. And talking about it makes us cognizant that part of who we are as Jewish people is not just scholars and, and givers of tzedakah, but people who stand ready to give everything. Lim Sen Nafsham Al Kiddush Hashem because of our connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and our refusal to become cut off from Him. So when it isn't real, you talk about it. Because we need to have it, at least in our minds, on an intellectual level. And that's how I understand what the Rebbe said to this Rav. The Rebbe said in America, where Mesir Nefesh is not a reality, you have to talk about it. Mesir Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem. And of course, you go back to the Gemara, which is really, really painful. The Gemara tells the story of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, who was one of the greatest in all of our history. The Gemara would say about Rabbi Akiva, Kulo Libad Rabbi Akiva, all of the Torah we have came to us after the bottleneck of uh, the story of the Tamid Rabbi Akiva passing away. And then there were a handful left from which Rabbi Akiva rebuilt Torah Shabbat. And the Gemara says, Kulo Libad Rabbi Akiva. Uh, uh, Rabbi... Um, uh, Rabbi Meir taught us one thing. Rabbi Yaisi taught us something else. Rabbi Loza taught us something else. Rabbi Huda taught us something different. But Kulu, Rabbi Shimon taught us something different. But it's all Rabbi Kiva's Tere. Ultimately, the whole Tere Shbapa, and perhaps even Timiyas Tere, Kabbalah is Rabbi Kiva. Rabbi Kiva is one of the greatest of the great. He was a person that until 40 years old did not know what Surah Salaf. And because of his wife's Mesiris Nefesh, he became a Godl Shebek Daylim, Begash Mesa The Gemara says he bought his wife. A Yerushalayim Shel Zohav, a golden crown with the landscape of Yerushalayim on it, to honor her for the Mesiris Nefesh she had for Tere. And he was killed, was murdered, Al Kiddush Hashem, as it's described in the Shoshana Machzid and in the Kiddush of Yom Kippur and so on. I'm sorry, the Yom Kippur Machzid and the Kiddush of Tishabav and so on. So the Gemara tells us a story. The Talmud Rabbi Akiva came to the cell where Rabbi Akiva was sitting, being held before his execution. And they said to their Rebbe, Rebbe, how could God Almighty, how could this be that a person whose whole Matthias is the Torah on the highest and holiest of levels, that there's a Gemara that says he understood the Torah better than Meshach Rabbein, should, should his end should come in this way. So Rabbi Akiva said to his students, it says in the Torah, You have to love Hashem with your whole soul. And the Mishnah says in Brachas, Afilu this means a person has to love a Kaddish Baruch Hu, even if it cost him his life. And Abba Kiva said, Kol mosa This is a mitzvah that you're not allowed to fulfill. You're not allowed to fulfill. A person is supposed to live. So Abba Kiva said, all my life I asked myself, there's a mitzvah which I'm not able to do. And I had a tzad, I had a pain that I'm not able to do it. And here, through the intervention of a Goya Rosha, Rabbi Kiva had the possibility for Mesiris Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem. So he said to his disciples, in effect, this is my will. Kol yom hitsa'arti mosa yovel yodav akamedi. When would such opportunity come to me? Now, of course, the good news is we're not Rabbi Kiva. We don't desire Mesiris Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem. And the Emir Hashem, the Ebesh is not going to give us that circumstance. But the idea that part of what we are as Jewish people in addition to all of the scholarship, and in addition to all the building that we do, and the creating, and, and the occupying, and filling this world with light and holiness, there is also a concept of Mesidas Nefesh, Al-Kiddush Hashem. 
And there's a story which the Rebbe repeated many times. And when the Rebbe told the story for the first time, or one of the first times the Rebbe told the story, he told it on the yard of his father, Rebbe Levik. And people understood at the time that when the Rebbe was telling the story, he was telling the story because of the relevance that the story had with his own father. The story is that the base Yasef, Rabbi Yasef Karo, who of course was one of the most prolific writers in our history, remember the Rebbe once saying in Fabreng that there are two tzaddikim who have the same yard site. The Tzemach Tzedek and the base Yasef both passed away on Yud Gimel Nissen. And it says in the Megillah Sester, Vayikaru Seferi HaMelech Bachedi Shari Yishen Bishlei Shasar Yembe. That the scribes of the king were called to write letters in the story of Megillah. So I put him on the 13th day of the first month. So the Rebbe said that the Seferi HaMelech goes on the Beis Yosef and the Tzemach Tzedek, who were some of the most prolific writers of Kedusha in Jewish history. And both of them were called to the king. That means the Neshama was Eilu Besar HaShamayma on this date on Yud Gimel Nis. Mishas is an incredibly prolific writer. He wrote a complete Pirush on Rambam called Kesef Mishneh, a complete Pirush on Shulchan Aruch on the Torah called Beis Yasef. Then he wrote his own Shulchan Aruch and then he wrote other Sfarim as well. And he had a very long life. He lived into his 90s. So the story is brought in the Sefer Magid Meshoram, which is one of the Sfarim that he wrote. That he was told, Men HaShamayim, that he's going to have this chos to be Mesa Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem. That he would merit this opportunity to sacrifice his life for the sanctity of the name of God Almighty. And it did not occur. He lived. So at a certain point, he realized that this offer, so to speak, this opportunity, this Indian was off the table, was not happening. And he came to his Rebbe, the Magid, or in another case it was the Arizal, and he said, I was given this offer, how come it's gone? And he was told that he did something that considering the level of the base Yasef, it was considered wrong. And because of this thing, that considering the level of the base Yasef was considered wrong, that he did, he in quotes, forfeited the schus for Mesiris Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem. I think I mentioned this once before in a class, I'll never forget this as long as I live. I remember where I was standing in 770, that I was at home. And it was after the Rebbe passed away, and the Rebbe said the following words: "The tate hat lechel zechig events will lighten Yisurim bagashmes." My father had this chus to suffer physically in this world. I remember hearing it, and I remember the shudder going through me that a man should say about his own father, especially a man like the Rebbe, who had a father like Rebbe Levik, and that's how the Rebbe expressed himself: "The tate hat zechig events will lighten Yisurim bagashmes to suffer physically." We don't understand these things. This is madrigas for big tzaddikim. It's called Yesudim Shal Ahava. It's called Mesir Es Nefesh Kiddush Hashem. And I remember when the Rebbe wasn't well. And it was known that the Rebbe had a lot of pain, extraordinary pain, very terrible pains. From what I understood, it was the kind of pains that were involuntary. It, it was in the brain. There was nothing you can do about it. And I remember flashing back to that Sikha. I think it was Tafshin and Alf Chafav. Or maybe it was Tafshin Nun. But the Rebbe said that. That by Tzadikim, there's such an Indian. In any case, the Beis Yosef was told that he had done something which, considering the level of the Beis Yosef, was considered less than ideal, and he was punished. What was the punishment? That he wouldn't suffer. And as a consequence, he lived a very, very long life, and he was a very prolific writer. He wrote some of the most important svarim we have until Mashiach comes, maybe the most important svarim we have until Mashiach comes. So the Rebbe made an observation. Here is a man who was offered Mercedes Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem and then had taken away from him. What happened as a consequence? Instead, he did something less. He wrote a Shulchan Aruch, he wrote a Pirish on Tur, he wrote a Pirish on Rambam. So, as Rebbe, you have to say that writing these kinds of Svarim is greater than, is less than, pardon me, Mercedes Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem. If by losing the opportunity for Mercedes Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem, he had the time to write such svarim that means Mesiris Nefesh Al-Kiddush Hashem is greater than writing some of the most important svarim ever written in our history. And the Rebbe says, how could that be? Mesiris Nefesh Al-Kiddush Hashem is for an individual person. Writing svarim of this caliber that called Niskava Ochol Twitter Sisro and it's the basis for the Torah that we have today in Halacha is for everybody. How could you compare the Mesiris Nefesh Al-Kiddush Hashem of one individual to the idea 
that a person writes Svarim that called Beis Yisrael Nishan Allah, Teda, which the whole Klal Yisrael needs and has forever for posterity. And the Rebbe said the question itself is the answer. From the fact that his forfeiting of the opportunity to be Mesa Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem got him years in which he was able to write these Svarim proves that when one individual Jew is Mesa Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem, it brings a hashpa, it brings a bounty, a blessing to the Jewish people on this world greater than having written such svarim. In other words, Mesiris Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem is not just a schus, a benefit for an individual, it's a benefit for the all of Klal Yisrael, and it's not only a benefit, it's literally a benefit, how great a schus does Klal Yisrael have when one yid in the past, of course, is Mesa Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem. The answer is, it is greater than writing the Kesef Mishnah and the Beis Yisrael and the Shulchan Aruch and so on. That's what the Rebbe said in the Sikh. And when the Rebbe said that Sikh, I think it was Shabbos Chafav Yud Gimel. Maybe it was Yud Beis. The Rebbe was implying that his father was Zeichet to be Mesa Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem. His father, Ablevik, passed away at 66. He was way before his years. He was an incredibly strong man. And Yesudim Amarkim. And the Rebbe was indicating that when a person, a tzaddik, is Mesa Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem, it's not only that for his neshama he's achieving incredible things, but the gili elokus in this world, the pale Yeshua, the kind of audits is so great that it's greater than writing svarim that everybody uses that are important for all and so forth and so on. And this, of course, is what the Gemara says. That those people who were Mesa Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem are in such a high level of Ganadin that the biggest tzaddikim cannot be together with them in the same Hechel Lamaila. So the Gemara says, Do you mean Rabbi Akiva Vechavero? Do you mean people like Rabbi Akiva? And the Gemara says, No, simple people who in their personal lives were actually not so pious, but there was an opportunity where they were able to save somebody. And in doing that, they paid with their lives. On such people we say, Harugi Malucha, Ein Adam Yocha Lamar Mchitzasan. People who are Mesa Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem, this is the highest Madrega possible, the highest mitzvah possible. There's a story that I heard, and maybe I even read, but it's a story, I don't know how true it is, but there's a story that people tell about a, a landowner, a Puritz, who came to a certain region, or he became responsible for a certain region. And a little while after coming to that place, he orchestrated a libel against one particular man. He created a Baba Misa, a false accusation, and he stirred it up. He, he created a whole conspiracy. He had the man put, arrested and put in jail, tried and sentenced to death. And nobody could understand why he was picking on this person and what was his crime. It was so cruel, it was so evil. And there was a public burning and they were going to pour molten lead into this man's uh, gullet, into his stomach, into his throat. And the Jews were forced to come and watch, which was a regular uh, feature of these public executions. And this man was brought up on the stage, and he was like, read his last rites, and he said some kind of a prayer. And the executioners opened up his throat by, uh, like it says in halacha, using a form of chanika. They opened up his mouth, and the hot molten lead was poured down his throat, and it was honey. And that's the end of the story. It was honey. It wasn't fire. It wasn't lead. So when this man, very much alive, was led off the stage, the, he turns and he sees the potets. And the potets walks up to him and asks him if he recognizes him. He says, I have no idea who you are. He says, my name is such and such. And this potets, when he was a boy, was an orphan, a goy. And he was ill-treated by everybody. And that Yid, who was a, more or less a contemporary of his, took a, a Rachmanis on him, and he looked at, he protected him, he fed him, he clothed him, he gave him a sense of belonging. And this guy carried around with him a debt. He has to give this Yid, who was nice to him when nobody else would be, something very meaningful. Now they spent a lot of time together, and during the course of the conversations, they talked about Yiddishkeit, religion, lahavl. And during one of the conversations, this young Yid had explained to the Goy in a way that he was able to understand it that the greatest religious opportunity a Yid can have is the Yid of Mesiris Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem. 
And he had asked him then, do you have to actually die or do you have to be prepared to die? He said, you have to be prepared. So he wanted to give this Yid as his debt, this chus of being Mason Nefesh HaKiddush Hashem, so he can trade it. These, he concocted this conspiracy. He had him arrested. He had him tried. He made him believe he was going to die. But at the last moment, there was no need for the actual death, just the preparedness for it, and he gave him honey. This is a story. It's an interesting story. It's a very, how sensitive must a non-Jew be to understand this concept of Mesiris Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem in such a sophisticated way? Where in Chumash do you have the Inyan of Mesiris Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem? And the answer is in this pasuk in our parsha in Pasha's Em and even in Dash Di Bitech Bnei It's actually a couple of weeks ahead of us, but like I told you, we're learning this Maim Evin Ekdashti, which is going to take us some time, so we're starting a bit early. The Rambam Paskins, on the words, Ekdashti B'Teich B'nei Yisrael, this is the mitzvah saseh of Kiddush Hashem, and then of course later on it says, V'lei Techalalu, it's Shem Kochi, that you're not allowed to make a Chilol Hashem, these are the two basic mitzvahs, that a Jew is not allowed to be a Chalol Hashem Shemaim, to desecrate, to make ordinary and plain the name of God Almighty, and that a person has to be ready to be Mesa Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem. It's a mitzvah to say the Eraisa Mesiris Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem. Now, when you study Mesiris Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem in Torah, you find a lot of subtlety. For starters, the Rambam in he has a Geras Hashmad, which talks about Mesiris Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem, and he also has it in Hilchos to say the I think it's Pedig Hey, which is dedicated entirely to the Mesiris Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem. There's different levels whether it's private or it's public, whether it's done for spite or it's done for hanod, there's all kinds of levels of Mesiris Nefesh, al Kiddush Hashem. There is a very, very famous footnote of the Rebbe, which is printed in Sefer HaMaimorim Tov Shin Tes. The Rebbe wrote this footnote on a Maimor of the previous Rebbe. And then later, when the Rebbe became Rebbe, they first put him, the Rebbe said the Maimor, V'kibol HaYehudim Tov Shin Yodalaf, which is now edited, it's printed in Malukat Chele Gimel. And in that Maimed, the Rebbe incorporated the idea that he wrote in that note in the Sefer of Maimodim Tov Shintes. And basically, the Rebbe has a question, because the previous Rebbe says in a Maimed that Mesiris Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem is not written in the data. And the source of this statement is a Maimed from the middle of the Rebbe, from the second Levavich Rebbe, that Mesiris Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem is not written in the data. So the Rebbe asks the question, what do you mean it's not written? It's a Pasuk Mufuresh, it's a Mitzvah Sasev in a Gdash Tepetech Bnei Yisrael. So the Rebbe has a very, very long and involved analysis of this. And he concludes that there's different levels of Mesiris Nefesh. This level of Mesiris Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem, which is a mitzvah. And then there's something which is even higher than that. And basically he says, a Jew has an obligation to keep Tehidah and Mitzvahs. One of the obligations of keeping Tehidah and Mitzvahs is that there are three mitzvahs that even if it costs you your life, you have to keep them, which are the prohibition against murder, the prohibition against idol worship of Eidah and the prohibition against immorality, for these three mitzvahs, you're supposed to keep them until the extent that you're going to give away your life. Al Kiddush Hashem. Says the Rebbe, that's a mitzvah. But then there is something else, where a person is made to Kiddush Hashem not because he's fulfilling a mitzvah, but he's simply sanctifying the name of God. In other words, when a person is made to Nefesh Kiddush Hashem not to murder, his focuses are not murdering. But he's not murdering, even if it means that he himself gets murdered. It's a prat in the Indian of Shvich Domim. That level of Kiddush Hashem is a mitzvah. But then there is the idea where a person is made to never Kiddush Hashem simply as a statement to sanctify the name of God. That higher level of Mesiris Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem is higher than mitzvahs. It's an Indian Kloli. It's also part of Yiddishkeit, but it's not included in the mitzvah Saseyev in Engdashti. And of course, one of the examples for this concept of Kiddush Hashem is Chanukah. Where the Rebbe explains in that Sikha that I referred to a while back, it's also in the Kutta Sikhas and Kamen Mekemes, that when the Chashminayim, when Mesa Nefesh, in the story of Chanukah, they violated every Allah and Shulchan Aruch. There was no heter. There was no excuse. There was no justification for the Mesir Nefesh, Kiddush Hashem, that the Chashminayim showed. Why? Because although there's a Mesiris Nefesh not to do certain Averis, there's a special Mesiris Nefesh if it's Beparhesia, 
Barabim. There's a special Mesiris Nefesh when it's a Shas Hashmad, when a guy wants you to do an Aveda, not because he needs something from your Aveda, but because he wants to spite you, he wants to force you to break your Das. In which case, a person is Mesa Nefesh, even for shoelaces, for Akash the Masana. But all of the levels of Mesiris Nefesh, Akhid Hashem, share one ingredient. The guy arrests you, he apprehends you, he takes you. And he gives you choices. If you are hiding, if you're living in a safe place, and you know that there's another place where Goyim are demanding of the Jewish people to make a decision, which either does or does not involve the Mesir, the Snefesh, or Kiddush Hashem, you're not allowed to go there. You're not allowed to sacrifice your life. You have to run away. What happened in the Hanukkah story? The Hashemunayim left Yerushalayim, they left the Beisemek, they ran into the hills around Yerushalayim, they're in a place called Maidian, and the Syrian Greeks couldn't get to them because their fortifications were strong, their roads were very narrow, and they, were, they, were, they, had, a, they had an advantage. They were uh, on an incline, they were above the enemies, and they, even if they would have been defeated, they could have withstood the onslaught of the Syrian Greeks for a long period of time. And the Jewish people made the decision to come out of those hills and go into that valley and engage in a guerrilla war with the Syrian Greeks. A war which Apiteva they could never win. They should never have won. So the Shailin Allah is who gave them permission to go out of the hills. They should have stayed there. And they should have enjoyed life and Tayra Mitzvahs. So long as it was absolutely possible. When they would be overrun, they'd be overrun. But you're not allowed to run towards Mesiris Nefesh. In other words, if the Yichash Menayim had gone to any Rav, Who's a made at all? Can Paskin Allah say, Are we allowed to do this? He would say to them, Not. But they didn't ask. They did it. They went to fight a battle with the Syrian Greeks that they could not win. They did not go to win. They went to die. And the entire justification for this act was to say to the Goy, to say to the Syrian Greek, You cannot destroy my faith. You may, you, maybe you could destroy my life. You cannot destroy my faith. It was a statement of principle of defiance and so on. And that's what Taki Dengamada says. That when the miracle of Hanukkah occurred, it took them a whole year to decide that Hanukkah was a Yom Tov. Initially, the Gemara says they told them no. A year later, the Shana Acheres became a Yom Tov. Why? Because it took a lot of thinking on the part of the Chachamim to recognize that even though the Chashmenayim did something that on some level was Hepech HaTeda or Lamayla Me'ateda Hiskima HaKadosh Baruch Hashem approved of what they did and the proof was in the fact that he performed the miracle for them and of course as you know it says in Chassidus and in the Sichas especially the miracle of the jug of oil which is totally unnecessary it was simply an act of Chiba it was a sign of love and favoritism from HaKadosh Baruch Hu to Klal Yisrael because of the Mesiris Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem that they had so this posuk, V'nikdash di b'teich b'nei Yisrael, is about Mesiris Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem. And we have explored the idea that in Mesiris Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem, there are a variety of different levels. So, I gave you an introduction. And now we have a shock for you. <laughs> Not one single word of what I said in the last half an hour or so has anything to do with the maimah we're about to learn. So why did I waste your time? I wasted your time because there's something very, very important that I need to make absolutely clear. There is a zayhar on this pasuk, and I'm using this opportunity to advertise my website, insidechasidas.org, which is an audio, an old audio website. There's many, many hundreds of classes, and they're all free. You can download them. I have a Siddha section in my website, which is relatively new, and I'm slowly building it with Hashem's help. You can visit and you can see what I have. One of the things that I have is I have a class or several classes on Kedusha. Nagdisha Chonaritza, Kedusha, and Chazar Sashat's Kedusha. And you can visit and you can listen to the classes. In those classes, I brought the Zayar, which goes on this positive, Ridashti Batech Ne Yisrael. And the Zayar says, Ridashti Batech Ne Yisrael means it's a mitzvah, as I say, to say Kedusha every day. Kedusha is for sure not a Deir Aise. It, I think it's in the Raya Mehemne. The Zayar has different mitzvahs than we have in his Sefer HaMitzvahs in the Raya Mehemne. V'nikdash tibteich b'nei Yisrael. It's a mitzvah, as I say, to say Kedusha. And the obvious question is, 
We all know that Shivan Panim Lateda. Teda has many different interpretations. But we also know that Rebbe has the famous Sikh about Shatnas. That when you have more than one interpretation to an idea in Teda, the various interpretations must be related. How can it be that one set of words, which is understood by Pashtas to refer to the concept of Mesiris Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem, simultaneously talks to something which is so simple and so easy, like saying, Nagdishach and Aritzach, Kaddish Baruch and Yimlech, Kiddush. How can there be a relationship between Mesiris Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem and saying Kaddish to the extent that from the very, very same Pasuk, in one place we learn the Inyan of Mesiris Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem, and in another place we learn from the very same words, they say Kiddush HaBachal Yeh. And the question I just asked you is the unspoken question of this Maimed. If you're not a count, yeah? This Maimed has 419 lines. There's a lot of uh, extensive notes which we're going to skip, but it's going to take us a while to learn this Maimed. This Maimed has a fundamental question. It's so fundamental it's not even asked. But it's the real question of the Maimed. How could there be any correlation, any comparison, between saying Nagdishach Naritzach or Kesa Yitnu Lacha, as all the controversy is, and the Ian of Mesiris Nefesh, Al Kiddush Hashem, one is so simple and easy. It's not even a mitzvah of Maisa, it's a mitzvah only of Dibur, it's about saying words. And the other is the ultimate act, the ultimate sacrifice, Mesiris Nefesh, Al Kiddush Hashem. Our Maimir intends on equating the recitation of Kedusha, Nagdishach Naritzach, Kaddish Baruch and Yimlech, to Mesiris Nefesh, Al Kiddush Hashem. So I gave you this entire introduction to underscore, to articulate in a way which is unequivocal, absolutely unequivocal, what Mesiris Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem is, so that you will appreciate just how awesome, how powerful a question it is, that Mesiris Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem, which is the greatest single act any Jew can do, is compared to saying Nagdishach Naritzach, which most of us say several times a day, I don't know how many times a week, how can the two be compared? That's the question. And of course, as the Maimon unfolds, the answer will become apparent. But I will do something out of character. I will attempt to keep it a secret. I'm not going to tell you the answer now. I'll let you find out. But that's what this Maimon is about. Vinigdashti, this Maimon is considered a classic. It's one of the most famous my modern in the entire Lakuta Teda. It's one of the my modern that boys who are 14 and 15 who are first beginning to learn Hasidus. This is one of the my modern that they learn. And of course, the reason they're learning it because it's quite an elaborate and clear expose on the levels of Mamala Kalaman and Seva Kalaman, as you'll see in Mitzvah Hashem in the later classes. But what the Maimed is really about is the equation between saying Kaddish, 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 and Mesiris Nefesh, Al Kiddish Hashem. How could the two things be equated? And without any further ado, let's begin. Lamed Lenin. I gave you an introduction, let's learn. So the Alter Rebbe begins, V'nigdash ti b'teich b'nei Yisrael v'geven. I am going to be made holy, I'm going to be sanctified b'teich amongst the Jewish people. And again, the understanding of this Pasuk, Im Shut Yishal Mikri, is the Yenom Esiris Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem. And this Maimon is going to explain it differently. So the Maimon begins on line 3, L'hov in mahu l'ashen teich. What is the reason we use the word b'teich? V'nekdashti, I will be sanctified, I will make holy b'toich from the inside of B'nai Yisrael, the Jewish people. Um, it should say, V'nekdashti b'b'nai Yisrael. What is the meaning of the word toich? Toich means inside. And you should know there's a, this particular form of question is found in other places in the Kutatayr as well, where he analyzes what does it mean b'toich, inside. The Pasuk the, frequently said, Ki tishma b'keil. That the Jewish people are going to listen to Kaddish Baruch Hu's voice. It says Kisishma Bekel. You will listen into the voice. And the Alter Rebbe said Kisishma Elkel to the voice. What's Bekel? And the Alter Rebbe's answer there is going to be the same as the answer here. That Betayich means what is beyond Bekel. Kisishma Bekel. What's don't listen to the voice. Listen what's hidden behind the voice. Similarly. V'nigdashti, b'tayich b'nei Yisrael means Hashem is going to become sanctified, either through Mesiris Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem, or through the recitation of Kedusha, Kaddish Baruch and Yimlech, b'tayich, by accessing what is deeper than what b'nei Yisrael are. That's going to be the kavanah. 
So we have to understand what is the meaning of this pasuk. Vilitashti b'teich. Vilitashti means mesiras nefesh al kiddush. What is the b'teich? And the answer will be forthcoming. Vegam. The second question here is: So the chlav may merazal the fanan and may merazal. Sheshgim will kites malach and the three types of malach. And now we first encounter the relationship between the pasuk vinigdashti and the idea of kedusha. Kat achas emeres kaddish. One group of malachim says kaddish once. Vekat achas emeres kaddish kaddish. Another group of Allah says Kaddish two times. Vekat achas emeres Kaddish Kaddish Kaddish. The third group says that Hashem says Kaddish Kaddish Kaddish. Ad Hashem tzvoy is vegeim. So the question is, the Chazal divided up amongst different Malachim. I say, these Malachim are saying Kaddish three times. These Malachim are saying Kaddish twice. And these Malachim are saying Kaddish once. What does all of this mean? Kid Isa b'chulun of Tzadik Alfam and Beis. This means, in other words, one group says Kaddish only once. The second group says Kaddish twice. The third group says it three times, which is how we say it, of course. And the question becomes, what is the significance of saying three times, Kaddish, 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 holy, holy, holy. There's a year that comes into 770, and i got to tell you, I think he provokes the whole shul. He's a biker. He comes in every day to put on film. And if he watches the film, I am saying this with the greatest of respect. He doesn't know how to read Hebrew. So he comes and he puts on film. He always joins a minion. He's always with a minion. But uh, he davens what he's able to daven. And when he gets to Chazar Sashatz, and we say, Kaddish, 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 he says loud, Holy, 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 the Lord of hosts, the glory fills uh, the, the, the whole world or something like that. And the first time I heard him say, holy, 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 it gave me a shake. Because somehow when you say Kaddish, Kaddish, Kaddish in Hebrew, it doesn't make you nervous. Why? Who's paying attention? Kaddish, Kaddish, Kaddish could be 493. Those are the first three numbers of my phone number. But when someone in shul says, holy, 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 the Lord of hosts, all of a sudden you're paying attention because you're not expecting it. I suppose you can get used to anything. But that's the idea. We say Kaddish, Kaddish, Kaddish. Maybe says holy and holier and holier still. What are the significance of the three times Kaddish? And the three groups of Malachim, one that says Kaddish once, a second that says Kaddish twice, and a third that says Kaddish three times. As we do, what is the significance of this? And then we move on to line eight. V'gam tzarech lov, and question number three. In addition to, to v'negdashti b'teich v'nei Yisro, how it has to do with Mesiris Nefesh and Kedusha and Teich, and to the question about once Kaddish and twice Kaddish and three times Kaddish, you have another question. Mashakos v'bazeir gam kein dezeir also says, Loshin kot ben, uh, pardon me. Mashikos ben nozir gamke by a Nazarite, by a person who's not allowed to cut his hair because it's a form of hafla, a form of neder. It says kodesh about his hair. Mashikos, as the Pasuk says, kodesh he should be holy, but because he's holy, gadel perasadesh, he should allow his hair to run wild. And of course, the question is by contrast. All of us know, sa'ar bi isha erva, a woman, especially a married woman, or Ba'ula is not allowed to go with the hair uncovered. It's considered private. It's considered something that has to be covered because of tzniyas. And if it's exposed, it's hepecha tzniyas, it's infant erva. So the question becomes, how can the very same phenomena in one instant be called erva and the other instant it's called kaddish? And just for the record, you're not able to say that this is the difference between men and women because men and women can both be nazidim. There's a cute story that goes around. I'll share it with you. That there was some yidin who came to Fahed the Rebbe. The Rebbe became a Rebbe, they came to Fahed and Lenin. And it was a bit silly to come and test the Rebbe in learning. So Rebbe Shmuel heard that there were people, Rebbe Shmuel of Itten was a big pikech. They came to Fahed the Rebbe and Lenin, so he uh, pulled them aside and said, I want to ask you a question. You look like very chosh of him. Maybe you can answer my question for me. And he asked him, can a Isha, can a woman be a Nazira? Can a woman be a Nazir? So they started a whole pilpul. Svaras Lakan and Svaras Lakan, why women can be another, women cannot be another. Anyway, they finished this whole pilpul that Shmuel says to them, he had a, a stutter. He said, Dach Sechmir, Dach Sechmir, as a state in Pasuk, Isha Isha. The Pasuk says explicitly, a man or a woman who wants to be another. And then he told them, Gate, Gate for Herd the Babach Herd. Go give the Babach Herd for Herd. They didn't know a Pasuk Chumish. But either a man or a woman could be another. So, Azoi, the hear of a woman, when it's exposed and uncovered, it's considered Tzad Bisha Ereva. And by another, the same phenomenon, the hair is considered Kaddish. How do you explain that? That becomes the third question. So in order to answer these three questions, we move on to another point. He makes if the Pasuk says, Srafim aimed in There's a group of Malachim called Srafim. 
They exist in Elam Abriya. And they're called Sraf because they're burning up with the Eish Kaidish. With a holy fire to HaKadosh Baruch because they're so close to him. And by these Malachim that are called Sraf, it says in the Pasuk, they're standing above God. And of course the question becomes, V'yesh lahoven, eich yitachen, how does it make sense? She'yam do mimah l'shechina, that something should stand above the Yevishter, above the Shechina. V'aleheim, nevroyim ba'lekvul, the malachim, the even the Shrafim are limited, and of, 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 of limited um, capacity. How can you speak of a creation and saying he's standing on top of God, higher than the Yevishter? Shrafim eim de mimah l'shechina, how can you say that the malachim called Shrafim are above l'shechina? Above a lakus, if a lakus is the truth, they're only nevrayim. I just want to insert here, we'll talk about this Mithra Sham next week, but insert here that you should know that on this Pasuk, there is the classic teaching of the Baal Shem Tev, which means a person finds himself where he wishes to be. If you want to be in a certain place, even if you're not geographically there, by your desire to be there, you're there, at least spiritually. And the Maimorim explained that since the Malachim desire to be connected to the higher levels of godliness, therefore we say, um, because the Malachim want to be on a very high level, although they're not on the high level, they're on a much lower level, they're desiring to be higher, um, means that they're spiritually there. That's how you explain this posik straf from aim the mimale. But in the meantime, it's a kasha. What does it mean? The malachim was standing the Ebishta. The Gdereb, line 11, and Ixiv, the answer to this question, and this now becomes question 5, it says in the posik, Imcha Mekir Chaim along with God Almighty, this is source for life. And the question is, It should say, You're the source of life. You're the source of life means life comes directly from Akadish Baruch. The Imcha Mekir Chaim means life does not come. Uh, directly from HaKadosh Baruch it comes through a secondary thing which is called Mekir Chayim, the source of life. And this secondary thing which is called Mekir Chayim is Imcha, is Tafel or Batel Lagabi HaKadosh Baruch This is the Shadar. What does it mean, Imcha Mekir Chayim? That the Ebesh has a Mekir of life for the worlds that are not him. They're only Imcha, Tafel or Batel. And compared to Hashem, they're insignificant. What does this mean? So the Rebbe says on line 12, a Yuvan called Zebe Hegdim Lahavin, Pirish Vinyan Kaddish. What's the translation of the word holy? And of course, you'll see in the next line, Kaddish Pirushay Muvdo. Holy means removed. Now, we learned very little of the Maimir. And for more reasons than one, this was done by design, it was done on purpose. The thing that I want you to take away from today's Shir is a discussion on Mesiris Nefesh Akidish Hashem. And I, I pray and I trust and I hope that you're not going to be upset and angry that I'm talking this way. I didn't invent any of this. I'm simply saying what says in Hasidus and what says in Torah and Sfarim, how Mesiris Nefesh al Hashem is a part of our lives. But Mesiris Nefesh al Hashem could be also in a way of a Chaybahim. We can actually live from it, not Hei Bechachayim, but that you have to take it very seriously. And in spite of the fact that Mesiris Nefesh al Hashem is such a high madrege, saying Kedusha, saying Kaddish, 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 equals it. And that, of course, is very hard to understand. And as the Rebbe would often say at the end of a sikh, we're going to revisit this next week and we'll begin to answer the question. <laughs>